Amen. service. Thank you, Lord God, for a book that contains so much, Lord Father. We could preach this thing all day and never, ever uh, get past any of it, Lord God. We could preach one chapter for all time and, and just see all that the Lord opens up, and we thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for a, a, a small, uh, it's a small book, but it has a lot of power. It's a small book, but it, ha it encompasses a lot. Lord Father, and we thank you for it. We thank you, Lord, for the message tonight. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. All right, we're in Isaiah 1. We're going to finish up the chapter, Isaiah 1. In uh, the first part of the chapter, uh, the Lord identifies some things, and, and he has a, I, Isaiah's a, a prophet. He's a writing prophet. He does no miracles. He, he has a vision, but it's a vision of words. A vision of words, the, the vision, Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And then the next thing he says is, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, and 
For the Lord hath spoken. He got a vision of words. And he wrote them down. And he spoke last time about uh, what, it, what they were doing, the things that they have done, their experience, their history up until this point, the things they had uh, happened. They were, he said they were dumb as an ox. Dumb as an ox. Uh, he said things like they had open wounds. And they, he said that uh, they should hear the word of the Lord. But what did they do? They refused. They refused to hear. Uh, he said, he turned around and told him, he said, how to get it. You, he told him, look, you need, a, you, need, you need not a religion. That's what happened. You were too religious. You need a relationship. Why? Because God hates religion. He said, there, he showed him, look, Israel, it should have been the great nation. Think about it under uh, Solomon, and it just went down, and it even split. And they had lost their preeminence among the, the nations. Israel had lost it. And now he's going to start looking at, in, in, in verse number 16, when we start, he, he's going to be looking at it. He's, he's going to be looking at how you can be restored. How to be restored. Uh, you use these verses as, as a salvation call, and, and, and it works. It's greatly used. But it's to the brethren. It's to Israel. It's to Judah. It's to the people that already know. It's the people who had the oracles of God who went over to these. He's trying to tell them to come back now. And he's going to show them two things. He's going to show them how they can get back. He's going to show them what they are and how he will restore them. That he's going to restore them. And, and, and if not, then he'll, they're going to be destroyed to do it. Let's look at verse number 16, and we'll read down from 16 to 20. The Bible says, wash you, make you clean. Uh, put away uh, the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Father, bless thy word tonight. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, in verse 16, he starts to come out. He says, uh, he said before in verse 15, he said, I'm not going to hear you. You give out many prayers and you make many prayers. And guess what? I ain't going to hear that. I ain't going to hear your religion. And you can do our father all day and I don't know who you are. Uh, you can turn around and tic-tac-toe three in a row and, and it's not going to work for me. You can bring down 20,000 sheep and with the wrong heart ain't going to work for you either. That's what he's looking at. Why? There's a whole lot of people that are playing religion. Even today, you got people praying, playing religion. Uh, they think they're doing something real good like God's sitting there going, oh, thank you very much. You're going to get a warm fuzzy because they hold the offering plate right. Or uh, they, they walk a certain way. Or they got this Protestant st uh, stigma uh, upon them. That's what God wants and, and, and God's not not impressed why no heart just no heart so he gives them starting to give them some remedy and he says wash you you need to be cleaned up you're dirty you need to be cleaned up he says wash you make you clean he, now here's how you do it what's that put them at the same time you notice a semicolon it's not a colon it's not a comma he says what you need to put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes you notice how, hey, look, did you notice how it didn't say before your eyes? Why? You might think it's clean. Right. Your ways aren't his ways. The standard is the book. It's not you. Right. That's why I always say these people that walk around, I even brought it, I bring it out. I say, look, with this, what would Jesus do? What, what in the world? Who, what, well, who cares what you think Jesus should do? It's what he already did. Right. And then you can find out how he acts from there. <clears throat> What would Jesus do? 
Well, that makes you God. That's what it does. It makes you God by your opinion. And then you can do anything you want because you think Jesus can do it. That's what you think. He says, wash you. You need to be made clean from your evil doings that are before God's eyes and cease. There's an outward thing here. Cease to do evil. Cease. Do right. Verse number 17. Learn to do well. Do you, you realize you have to learn that? You have to. We were brought up kids. Kids don't naturally get it. Why? How do you know? Well, look at the kids today. No spanky. You got a little brat running around. Guess what? You remember them kids in the store that were screaming in the aisles and in the seats of those the carts? You remember the kids that threw themselves down on carpets screaming and yelling? And the teachers just went, oh, well. And the parents went, oh, well, you're not my little baby. Yeah, grab its arm, give it a little whack. It works. How do you know? Because those kids are the grown-ups today. That's why. They're now the 20 and 30 years old. Hey, hey, look. Time out don't work. Get that. Time out don't work. Why? Hold their arm up like this and take that old hand or paddle and give them a good whack in. That works. Amen. Amen. Says, Learn to do well. You got to learn it. Seek judgment. Learn to live well. So, you know, you're supposed to live just. Why don't you? He says, seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. We learned about that even today. Stop putting burdens on people. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the, for the widow. Do right. Let's look over at Proverbs chapter 21. It's a great verse. It's a great verse. I think preachers should be the ones that read these, this verse right here in, in Proverbs chapter 21. Look at verse number 3. It's been, Look, to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than what? Sacrifice. sacrifice. But I tell you what, everybody thinks they'd rather do sacrifice, mm -hmm. wouldn't they? Yeah, remember with uh, with Saul, what did he say? He said, better to obey than sacrifice. It's better to obey than sacrifice. Why is that? If you're obey obeying, you wouldn't need it. Yeah. If you were obeying, you wouldn't need it. Now, today we got the sacrifice that helps us to do what? To do right. To do right, we have the sacrifice. We have the Lord who made the ultimate sacrifice, and now he's dwelling in us. The Holy Ghost is telling us, uh, is leading us and guiding us in things, we have the ability to do right. Amen. We have that ability. We need to do this. Do right. And get, but look at 18. Come now. Let us reason together. You know what? God's reasonable. He's not an unreasonable God. What, what, what the problem is, is we're unreasonable for God. We're unreasonable for God. He wants to reason. Hey, look, the difference here is he says, come, God's saying, come, let us reason together. You know what the problem isn't that God wants to reason with you. The problem is you keep wanting to reason with men. Right. And you don't want to reason with God. You'd rather have your time to, hey, look, something just happened. Let me go tell, let me go talk to this guy. God's sitting there saying, I want to reason with you. And he wants to reason with you. And what do you do? You go to rational people and start reasoning with people instead of reasoning with God. Go to uh, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 12. He's saying, God wants to reason with you, but nobody wants to reason with him. Right. I think one of the reasons is is because you know God's always right. You know you're going to get you might get the wrong answer. People don't like getting the wrong yeah. answer. First Samuel chapter twelve, verse number six. And Samuel said unto the people, "It is the it is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron, and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. 
Now, therefore, stand still, that I may reason with you before the Lord of all righteous acts, of, before all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and to your fathers. He says, therefore, stand still, that I may do what? I want to reason with you. You notice he didn't say, I'm going to kill you for doing wrong. He, he wants a reason with you. You know, God, he'd rather have repentance than anything else. Amen. They rejoice in heaven over repentance. They never hear them say they, revert, they, they rejoice over destruction. It's over repentance. Uh, well, Lord, I'm in a mess right now. This judgment I've, I've had, it's, it's a mess. Uh, yes, God wants you to reason with him. But no, you'll reason with everybody. Hey, yo, can you help me out here? To other people, you haven't even asked God to help you out. Right. But you'll ask out other people to help you out. It says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they're red. Sin stains the soul. It's That's what it's trying to tell you. Sin stains the soul. They shall be what? White as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Sin stains the soul. Go to Job chapter 10. Job chapter 10. In Job chapter 10, <clears throat> watch how Job looks at this and look at verse number 14. We went through this before. He said, if I sin, then thou markest me. You see? Stains the soul. And thou wilt not acquit me from mine iniquity. You get a mark because sin, it stains your soul. That's what it just told you. Uh, people marveled at this verse. It, it says, uh, though your sins be as uh, scarlet. Well, how could you mean our sins are red? Man, it's marked up your soul. You sure got some stains. You got some red on your soul. And guess what? That mark needs to be talked to over with the Lord. But you'll notice something he said there. I ain't gonna. I ain't taking away the iniquity there. What's that mean? You gotta. You gotta reason with God. You gotta. You gotta come to the Lord and with a pure heart. And you gotta work with the Lord. You gotta reason. Right. You got a reason with him. Let us reason together. And we're unreasonable with God. Verse 19, if ye be willing. Well, did you just hear what I heard? This is a free will thing. Bye-bye, Dr. Calvin. You're no good for this one. Why? Because everything is by free will. It's not by election or anything like that or uh, irresistible things. It says here, he says, he turns around, he says, if ye be willing. And what? Obedient. obedient ye shall eat the good of the land and he says you'll eat the good of the land if you do well and if you be willing and you be obedient guess what I'll, I'll let you eat well in that land I'll, I'll give you uh, the good of the land but here comes the but but if you refuse and rebel ye shall be devoured with the sword and for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. You know, it's kind of like this. You're free to choose. You're free to choose, but God has a, he has the choice of the consequences. You're, hey, look, check. door number one or door number two, it's your choice. Oh, I'll take the wrong one. I'll take your door number two. Okay, you understand when you open it up, the consequences that are there, God's holding them. Right. He's holding the consequences right there too. Okay, he has uh, the choice of the he, he has the choice of those consequences uh, that you uh, are willing when you're willing to open up the wrong door. Uh, but if you open up the right door, guess what? You got the good of the land. Yeah. Do you realize that your your uh, walk in the world has been constant forks in the road? You don't even realize it's constant forks in the road. What's that? You got a right way and a wrong way. He always told you there's a broad way, there's a there's a narrow way. He's always said, "Hey man, there's one way or the other in the Bible." Uh, what's that telling you? You're you're either on the right way or you're on the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> you either uh, you you go along, and there there's points in your life that you've taken the wrong way, 
If you look at a fork in the road, people, what you'll notice is, being that it's a Y, it's like this. So if you take the wrong way, just say God's way is this way, and you take the wrong way, what you have to realize is that when you went the wrong way, and the further you go on the wrong way, the further you are from the right way. Right. How do you get over there? Well, you just don't take a via interstate this way. you got to go all the way back and all the way up. That's the way God's world is. Okay? What are you trying to say? Hey, you know what else it's hard to do? When you're going the wrong way and you're off on the wrong way and you're off on the wrong way, guess what you realize? The distance is so, it can get so far that they don't even hear you no more. Right. On the other road. Because it's, you've gotten far away now. You went the wrong way. We see it every day. We call it backsliding. When you get back, repentance brings you right back to that part of the V. Before you take the, before you take the wrong way, it takes you right back there. Get on the right way. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. If you be willing, but if you refuse. Verse 21. Uh, how? Now look at it. It says, how has the faithful city become a harlot? You notice that there's no question mark there? That's a statement. How has it become a, it doesn't, he thought, hey, look, I got to say it like this. God don't need to ask you questions right. on that. How, he already knows the history. He's just been giving it to you. How, how the faithful city become a harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness, lodged in it. But now a bunch of murderers. But now it's a bunch of murderers. Uh, the silver is become dross, Brother Larry. Yeah, it's yeah. become dross. Yeah. And the wine... Uh, is mixed with water, okay? Uh, the silver has become dross. It, it's, 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 it's just waste now. The silver, that beautiful looking silver is, is now, looks like it's black. It's, it looks like that stuff that's foamed at the top, the stuff you cut away and get rid of. It's the waste. That's what your silver has become. If you want to depart from the Lord, you know what you got? It's going to bring something in your life called deterioration. It's going to bring in degeneration when you go far from the Lord. Hey, uh, why don't we look at some little areas of worldly knowledge of it. Let's go to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We, we went over this. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. The silver has become dross. Thy wine mixed with water has become diluted. Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts. Look down at uh, verse Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Watch what he says in verse 16. He says, And moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment. I saw under the sun the place of judgment. What's that? That's your leaders. That's the court down the block. That's the mayor down the way. He says he's talking about uh, the people that are in charge. He says, uh, moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment. Hey, guess what? That's also the preachers, the place of judgment. That's the deacons. That's the preachers, the pastors. He says, moreover, I saw under the sun on this earth a, the place of judgment. What was it? That wickedness was there. And the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. Not only was the, was the problem over there, the wickedness wasn't just over there in the political scheme. Guess where else it was? It was in the church house. And we see it today. It's in the church house. It has become, uh, has become like dross and stuff. And the princes are rebellious today. Look over, let's go over to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, verse number uh, 31. Another parable uh, put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seed. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree 
so that birds of the air come and lodge, lodge in the branches uh, thereof. You see, uh, there's your, you can either take it that way, uh, the silver is dross, the prince is rebellious, the departing from the Lord brings deterioration, all that, or you can go the other way. Yeah. And it brings better things. And it brings places for people to, to, to be able to bask under. But what happened? The princes, they're rebellious. Look at first, back to Isaiah chapter 1. The princes, chapter, verse 23, the princes are rebellious. And companion of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, mm -hmm. neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. You know what the big problem they have? They're, bri they, they, they're always subject to bribery. The princes, they're subject to bribery. Hey, look, uh, a senator comes into the Senate, he makes it, you know, almost $200,000. And, then, and within six years, they're a multimillionaire. How'd they do that? They took money. They took money. And the thing you got to understand is the reason, the reason everybody's upset that these people aren't being prosecuted now that it's all opened up and people are seeing it today is because the people who are prosecuting, they did it too. Yeah. They're all together. It's all one big little happy family of thieves. And rebellion is there. And they're all doing it. And when you open up the door, finally a man comes in that doesn't need a salary. Finally a man comes in who's not taking the money. And he opens up the door and he sees it all. And guess what? He's got a lot of enemies this day. This country has all it's been is a power broker for other countries and been exchanging money for years and not doing anything. No manufacturing. Why? Because it's easy to be a broker and it's easy to just put money in your pocket and let everybody else do the work. Yeah. That's what it's become. Uh, he says, the princes, they're rebellious. And he says, and the companions of thieves, everyone that loveth, everyone loveth gifts and follow after, they follow after rewards and medals and stuff like, they judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow uh, come unto them. A very good verse. Go to Proverbs chapter 17. You'll see this verse, and you've read over it, and you never thought of it. But right now, when I'm talking about this, you're going to see it so much differently for what it says. Remember, Proverbs, you get into them, they're very deep. They're very deep. You're going to see it immediately when I tell you, when I start reading it to you. Proverbs chapter uh, 17. Now look at verse number 23. A wicked man... Taketh a gift out of his bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. Mm -hmm. Hey, how many times in a movie have you seen this one? Yeah. They take, they get the envelope. Yeah. They take it that to bribe. They take it out of their bosom. Yeah. And they give it out. They take it. Put, the other guy puts it in. I've seen it. They've actually caught these things right when people are talking on videos nowadays. And they show it. They show them handling envelopes and everything else now. And everybody sits there and they hear it. They see it. And they, it's just like it never happened. Yeah. Just like it never Even with videos today. It's like it never happened. We need to get rid of all these bums. Amen. Verse number 24. Therefore. Therefore. It's a therefore saith the Lord of the Lord of hosts. Uh, let's, let's recognize the one. Not just the Lord, the Lord of hosts. The mighty one of Israel. You notice the Yvonne, it has a capital O. The mighty what? It's his name. It's his name. <laughs> the mighty one of Israel. Ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of my enemies. Uh, the Lord is, you know, the Lord's going to remove them. I've had enough. Therefore, what? I've seen what these princes have done. I've seen what these leaders have done. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to remove them. And there's a time when God's going to come in in Matthew 25, when he gets into it, when he comes into Jerusalem, he's going to get all these leaders together. Uh, it's right there in, in 25, verse number 41. It's going to get them all together like he gathers sheep, and, it, and he's going to divide the sheep from the goats. And he's going to say, well, did you, did, what did you think of me? Well, I, 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 I thought of uh, Israel. That Okay, I understand it's a malissimal one. But what about you over there? You didn't like Israel. 
That means you didn't like me. That's exactly what it means. Amen. You know, the Lord's going to get rid of some of these. Uh, he's going to remove his enemies. And you know, the thing you got to understand is we can't do it ourselves. That as soon as somebody gets into leadership, they get perverted almost immediately. They're no good by the end of their term because they've been so big on taking and, and putting their name in likes and getting reelected that they keep it up and keep it up and keep it up just to keep in office. That's like a profession now, and it's a dirty profession, and the only way it's going to stop is the Lord's got to be the one that steps in. Amen. Amen. Verse 25, and I will turn my hand upon thee. I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away the dross and take away all thy tin. You're going to refine it with a, with a fatherly chastening. What's that mean? Somebody's getting spanked. Somebody's going to get a spanking around here. Uh, you know, you got to think of it this way. The, Lord's, uh, the Lord says we're his kids, right? So if we're his kids and he's our father, sooner or later, one of you and me or one of us, guess what? Once in a while, has to get a good spank. It, it, sometimes it's, you know, I don't know about you, but I had a, I, my father spanked us. Okay, my dad spanked us, and there was times at, at times when you know uh, he'd grab a hold of one of the one of my sisters, and I'd be like there because I'm the one that was always getting grabbed. So all of a sudden I'd see Tina get grabbed, and I tell you I was like, <laughs> 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 but sometimes the, the part is that sometimes I see people in the church getting chasing, and you you know. And, and you're like, they're, they're like thinking the end of the world has come. And, you know, to tell you the truth, I'm looking at it going, well, you know, just get back in line. What, what is it? It's a little, I, I, look, I feel bad because I see what's going on. And sometimes you look and you see, you can tell sometimes. And you just, well, you know, you're getting your little spanking. And then you see the person get right back in. And then, and then, they, then in a few months, then later on in a few months, they say, usually come out and they say, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> amen amen it happens it happens go to uh, uh psalm 94 go to psalm 94 he says whom he loveth he chasteneth." it how many times b times b times that's more than more I don't understand. There's these other kids that have ran away and and they're doing what they want living like the devil why ain't they being chastened because they're living like the devil. It's not like they're trying to stay with the Lord. Still get it sooner or later. The world will beat them up. He's just waiting for them to return. Uh, <clears throat> Psalm 94, look at verse number 12. It says, Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of how? Out of thy law. You know what the Bible's saying in there? It's saying it's a good thing. It's saying, blessed is the man who got chastened. Why? Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Amen. Blessed is the man that gets chasteneth. Why? Because that man the Lord loves. Right. You know, you got to think about some things. I watched, uh, I watched in my lifetime, and I watched today, I see a lot of preachers. I get to talk to a lot of preachers. One of the things I noticed that there's like different camps that set up, and some of them have some real awkward standards. And they have standards like if a man gets divorced, he can't get married again. It's silly and stupid. Okay, because God didn't want them in the beginning. Yeah, but a lot of people are unsaved. They got their sins washed away. What do you, what do you, what do you, but the problem isn't that. I don't want to go all into that. The problem is them. The problem is that a person gets saved and all of a sudden some guy's trying to stick it to them at, at those times and trying to uh, put more weight on it than he needs to put on him and uh, doesn't even realize, you know, what he's doing to the church in a whole. I mean, what do, you, what do you expect after eight years? After eight years, uh, uh, this isn't of God. Don't you think God would have already done something about this? Right. Uh, what do I do? Give all the people back? Look, I'm not trying to justify myself. What I'm saying is you're a fool to go after and look at somebody else's ministry and to say those type of things. Right. And you see God bless him. You know what the problem is? It's envy. Because you're not getting blessed. That's the problem. 
It's just envy because you're not getting blessed. A man, I had a man come in here one time and tell me, you know, you're divorced. I said, well, what's she like? <laughs> She's not divorced and she's sitting there. I'm like, well, what's, why, why is she here? And the guy goes, no, 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 for the ministry, you can't be, you shouldn't be, and you're not, you've been divorced. Uh, are you applying for the job? Oh, well, no. Shut up then. Just shut up. You're sitting back there doing nothing, and you're going to turn around and tell people that are doing something? You, you're, you, you've lost your mind. That's right, amen. That. Amen. Better wake up. Because it looks like everybody that's going into the ministry today seems to be divorced. You better look around. They're the ones getting saved today. Yeah. People that have been in the mess are getting saved today. Why? Because they see it as the only opportunity they got to get clean is the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? He is. Amen. Amen. Verse number 25, he says, I will turn my hand upon the impurely purged Purge away the dross. I'm going to chasten you. And I'm going to take away all thy tin. And I will restore thy judges as at the first. And thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, thou shalt be called the city of righteousness. The faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment. And her converts with righteousness. The Lord will restore and uh, his city, his city, and he will do it with righteousness. He'll restore his city. He will rebuild his city. And guess what? His city will be redone with righteousness. It'll be done. And you know what else? Make sure you know here in verse number 27, with Zion shall, re shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness. God is going to do it. Right. Yeah. He just told you he's going to do it. And imagine when he's saying it, I'm going to, he says, I'm going to redeem her with judgment, but that part and her converts, uh, they're going to be done with righteousness. What's that? That means the converts don't have righteousness all the time. Right. They got to, hey, look, here's the thing you got to understand about religion. You have to understand about your choice. He's in God, he goes all the way back to the garden. The first thing when Adam sins is he does is he turns around and he says, well, let me try and get back with the Lord, but I'll do it my way. So he grabs these, uh, he grabs the fig, fig leaves and everything. He starts making clothes and he starts to put himself together and he starts to cover himself up from what? He's naked before the Lord. He's got nothing stand before the Lord in. So he starts to make his way back. The Lord, let me dress up myself. Let me get these fig trees. Let me get my own righteousness. Put it all together. And he goes and he comes out before the Lord. He's hiding. He doesn't think his righteousness is okay. That's obvious. I was hiding. Even with his own works, he's hiding. Why? He knows. Yeah. He gets in front of the Lord and the Lord starts talking to him. He says, what are you doing? And he says, you know, well, I'm scared. I'm naked. Right? And then what happens? The Lord has to, he has to be willing for something to happen. What's that? He has to be willing for the Lord to take away his, his self-righteousness. I gotta drop my self-righteousness and I gotta pick up the Lord's righteousness. That's a church house today. There's a lot of people that need to drop their own righteousness. I talked about this today with the standards and the and the convictions, pressing them on to other people. And and the Lord saying, Look, man, your self-righteousness is your problem. Mm -hmm. You have to drop your aprons, you have to drop your fig leaves. You have to drop that and let me put on, hey, I got another garment here. Put this on. What's this? What does this have? Well, this is a humble garment. Well, see this garment? This is a garment of lose thy pride. This is a garment of God's righteousness, not yours. Yep. That's the difference. God says, I'll restore you, but what? I'm the one that's got to do it. I'm the one that's going to clothe you. I'm the one that's going to restore you with righteousness. Verse 28. And the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together. And they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. For they shall be ashamed of the oaks which ye have desired. And ye shall be confounded for the gardens that ye have chosen. For ye 
shall be as an oak whose leaf fadeth, and as a garden that hath no water. Now you can understand that one. It, it, a garden that has no water. It's like, do you ever, anybody here ever eat peppers? Yeah. Okay? You see the pepper like a ha habanero. It's a very hot pepper. But it's about this big. But if you take the water away, that pepper shrinks up and shrinks up. And you know what else it gets? It gets hotter and hotter and hotter with less water. Less water makes it hot. Less water makes it angry, I guess, or something like that. But it makes it hot at each time. It's not as nice to eat as it gets worse and worse with no water. It's got a lot of kick in it when it has less water, just like you. You get hard and your, your heart gets hard when you have less of the word and less of the word and less of, just stop reading your Bible for a month and see how it does for you. Watch your attitude. You think it's going to be good or think it's going to be worse? It's yeah, going to be worse. Why? There's something different about this book. There's a supernatural quality from the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, and through Jesus Christ. And guess what? That's what washes away a lot of what you got. God says, hey, man, we need to reason together. You got to get back in this book. You got to get back with me. You got to get a repentant heart. Why? I don't, you're not, you're not, it's not working out this way. It's not working out this way. Okay? Uh, to re God must, God's got to first, um, he's got to first, he's got to remove that which offends, you know. And they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. He's got to get rid of what's offending out there. Uh, go to Jeremiah chapter 1. That's why at the last, right, at the, right after he gets, gets in, when he comes in at the day of the Lord, he's going after the leaders right off the bat. That's who he's going after. Everybody has it, they have the wrong idea. Chapter 25, right in there, he comes in, people are gathered up. He says from the whole ends of the earth, he's going to gather up people. Now everybody, oh, well, that's a rapture. That's what it says. What's the next thing that happens? When he gathers them up, we go over to a judgment. He gathers them up. People are going to a judgment. And guess what? The leaders, it says. The nations. Guess who's there? There's your leaders. And he's going to look at them. And he's going to see. Uh, Jeremiah chapter uh, 1. Look down at um, verse number 10. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to do what? Plan. You see, that's the first thing he's going to have to do. What's that? He's got to get rid of them. He's got to get rid of them so that he can. That which offends must be removed. And then what's going to happen? Then comes the rebuilding phase. What's that? Isaiah uh, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a king is a child is born and a king and everything. And he says the government's going to be upon his shoulder. He's going to be taking care of it. He's going to be the boss. And his kingdom is going to be, uh, he's going to rule in Jerusalem. His kingdom is going to be everlasting and ever growing. And that's our God. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's our God. And after the last battle, you know what he does then? He does his, he does his judgment. Then he takes the kingdom into a wide scope. From there, it just goes way uh, uh, ever expanding from that point on. An everlasting kingdom of our God. He says, they shall, they that forsake the Lord, what's going to happen? They're going to be consumed. For they shall be ashamed of the oaks, which ye have desired, and ye shall be confounded for the for the gardens that ye have chosen. What garden you eating out of? Hey, I, you ever notice that Isaac he finds three wells. He finds the wells, and one well is like of strife, and one well is of contention, and then the other one is that he found the place for us. I gotta ask that question, man. What well are you drinking of? Right. You got the contention. You drive. You drink it of the well of strife, or, or you drink it of the well uh, of good water, of living water. Which one are you drinking of? Hey, I got a question for you. What what garden you you've been hanging out in? Right. You've been hanging out in the garden of the fruits, the good fruits. Or you've been hanging in the garden of the nuts. That's the difference. You get the garden of the fruit, or you get the garden of the nuts. Which one are you hanging in? I got to tell you something. I think I'm hanging in the garden of the nuts sometimes. And I'm not talking about in the outside the church house. I go outside, I'm watching television, I'm like, man, I'm in an insane asylum. 
Can I change the channel? It just won't change. I mean, come on. Which garden are you eating out of? Eat out of the good garden, you know? Um, he says, for ye have a, uh, for ye, verse 30, for ye shall be as an oak with a leaf faded, fadeth. You're, you're like a, look, an oak is a strong tree, but when that leaf fadeth, it doesn't look like a good tree anymore. It doesn't look like what's coming out of that tree. What's protecting leaves protect a tree. That's what they do from, from heat and everything, from the power of the sun or whatever. It protects its fruit that way. But you get too many leaves, it's like religion. It covers up the fruit, strains it, and it doesn't get big. Amen. That's why when Jesus said there were too many leaves on that big tree, the figs couldn't come out because there were too many leaves. They, were, they weren't let, allowing the, them to grow. He says, uh, for ye, have, ye shall uh, be as an oak whose leaf fadeth and as a garden that hath no water. No water. He would have, uh, if you go to a Protestant church and they, they go over, they got all these creeds of men. They go all these things, uh, say this prayer, say that prayer. Uh, just no different than, than the store down the block. Say this prayer, say that prayer. Uh, let's stand up, do our Father. Let's do this, let's do that. Uh, do it this way. Uh, they're getting even to the point where they're doing the uh, repeat after me thing when somebody turns around and says, the Lord be with you and also with you. They don't even know why they're saying it. <laughs> they have nothing. Their heart isn't in it to say that. It's just they're reading it. It's like you ever get down on the Bible and you're just reading verses. It doesn't mean anything to you. Just reading for the sake of reading. Well, sometimes you got to stop, and that's what I say. you got to stop and study. Why? Because you got to understand sometimes what you're reading. You want to understand why. God's trying to speak to you. He's not trying to be Charlie Brown's teacher, and that's why you hear him. I just read the words. I'm good. Check in the block, God. Got that one done. He's like, you, you just went over the words. You just pronounced the words. You didn't understand the passage. Okay? God's trying to talk to you. Start listening. Verse 31, and the strong shall be as a toe, and the maker of it as a spark, and they shall both burn together, and none shall quench them. Uh, basically, it's called total destruction if you're on that side. Hey, look, you ever notice that God does this? He, he, gives, you the, he gives you your problem. Here's the problem. You, this is your history. It's what happened. And then he turns around and he shows you. He never does it without telling you how to restore it and tell you how good it can be afterwards. But then the one, what's the last thing he does? He gives you a warning. He gives you a warning. Why? Because you haven't listened, and there's the warning. Look, I want you to come, come, come sit. Come with the Lord. He says, come. He's telling them to come. And they, they refuse, and they refuse. And, he, and then they, you're going to burn. Look, I... I, I I got saved because somebody told me I was going to hell. You know why? Because other men came and told me how great Jesus was, and I didn't want that. So God had to jar me up a little and say, hey, man, last warning, you're going to go to hell. I woke up pretty quick. Five years later, I got saved. All I could think of was hell for five years. That's bad. <laughs> yes. I don't know how many times I lost sleep at night even worrying about it. And, and my wife will tell you, when I get worried, and I lose sleep, I'm walking around the table and the dogs are following me today. Think about how it was back then. <laughs> Amen. I couldn't even drink it away. It was, it was always there. He says, and the strong shall be like toe. And the maker of, that's just rubbish. And the maker of, uh, of it as a, as a spark. And they shall uh, both burn together and none shall be a quest. The idol and that idolater, your religion, and what you have trusted in, it's going to burn, and it's going to burn all together with you. How many religious people are going to be in hell? Imagine a person who gets to hell, and the first thing they realize, number one, imagine that day when that great physicist, that great one that says there is no God, that great astronaut that went upstairs and says, I don't see a God, will take that little oxygen tube out of that helmet, and you'll see him real quick. Amen. <laughs> and guess what? You'll be with your, you go down, and guess what the first thing he's going to say? First of all, I'm very surprised at what? It's real. You know the second thing you can think of? It's permanent. Am I staying here forever? 
I mean, is it really like this for the whole time? And it keeps going. And it keeps going. And then he's looking around. You know what he sees? Look at all the religious people here. What? Wait a second. That's John Paul II. Yeah. They're all down there. You know where, what they're with? With their religion. They took it with them. That's what they took with them. You take Christ. Amen. Amen. If you got one thing that's going to go with you, it's Christ. It's Christ. He's waiting on the other side, waiting for you. Amen. Amen. And you're waiting for, your soul's going, yes, that's where I want to be. I mean, even Paul, I mean, when Paul was stoned and got up, he was dead. He walked back in. He went right back into the place he was in. I mean, what a crazy man. But then again, how crazy can you be? He's like, I guess Paul kind of thinking like, well, I know how I got there. Now I can get there. I know how to get there again. <laughs> and he walks right back in and, and into the place where they stoned him. He walks right back into the town where they stoned him at. What's that? That's a lot of bravery of knowing where you're going to go. Imagine the assurance that he had. You know, I mean, that's what God, he says, if you read the Bible and keep reading this Bible and keep reading this Bible, you find some things. Number one, he says, you're going to never die. Right. I got a question for you. What are you so afraid of? Right. What are you so afraid of? He told you you never die. But you're still afraid of it. Why are you still afraid of it? Keep reading the book. Why? Because if you keep reading the book, you know where you're going at all times. And you start to get acquainted with it more. Why? Because that book is telling you of a place that's so much better than here. Hey, I'm not talking about suicide. That's crazy stuff. You're not, you shouldn't be in command of that way. I, I only say that if it's come to the point where your quality of life is so blistered. But let me, at the last breath, you can always say to somebody, you need to get saved. Amen. If you ain't saying it, guess who else is? Probably nobody to the people. Right. So you stay in there. Look, the Lord's looking at it this way. He's looking at your dross on his people, and he says, I gotta get rid of that junk. See, you're my people. I gotta get rid of it. Why? I don't like the junk. It's not working out. Get rid of the junk. How do I do that? Well, get to get to get to that book and, and get to that altar of that book and start reading that book and start praying to the Lord and start repenting. Why? So you can be like this with you. Right. And then you won't have that dross. You won't have that mindset. The more you read that book and the more you read that book, you got to do another thing with it. And that is you got to go walk it. Yep. You got to walk that walk. You've got to you can talk it all day, you can learn it all day, but it's got to be walked with it. And once you're doing that, what do you got? You got a good relationship with the Lord. Guess what? When everything's said and done, there you are standing there with Jesus. When everything is said and done. You're with Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's good to be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for our time here. We thank you, Lord, that you give these and give us instructions that we may be saved, Lord Father, and not just that, that we may be restored with thee, Lord Father. Thank you, Lord God, for showing us a future in this book, Lord God, that we know that no matter what, that no matter what, sooner or later, Lord, we're with you. We want to thank you with from from, from our hearts, Lord Father, and this is Bible Baptist Church, Lord Father, and these are my faithful that are here, Lord God. And Lord God, I just pray, Lord God, that we get that mindset of assurance with Thee at all times, that we get more acquainted with heaven than we are with earth. And we thank You, Lord, for being good to us. Thank You, Lord. We pray for Mary, who's not here today, Lord Father, right now, and we just ask if You would, Lord, to help her out where she at the house, uh, uh, Lord, that you would uh, uh, reach in and, and give her a, a, a healing time, Lord Father. She's scared, Lord God, and she needs assurance from me too, Lord. She's tired. Her body is, her, her spirit's willing. It's just her body now, Lord. And we're just asking you, Lord, to move, move some of that spiritual thing over like, you, like you've done and, and touch the body, Lord Father, and, and just quicken it, Lord Father, a little. We know your touch is just, just that incredible. And we're asking for that spiritual touch to her body. You've done, we know you've done great jobs, and we're, we, we praise you for it, Lord, but we could ask for more. We can always come and ask for more water and ask for more blessing. So we thank you, Lord, for it, and we love you. Thank you for uh, chastening us today, and thank you, Lord, for talking to our hearts all day. This has been a great day in the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the spiritualness 
that you give us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.